Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Jeremy Peat, director of the David Hume Institute. Um, we're being very brave tonight in uh, unleashing three academic speakers on you. Um, and uh, this comes after our five politicians we've had over the last five or six weeks. So uh, this is uh, a, a totally different topic in some ways, but it's uh, related to the same key issues. So we're talking about should Scotland have its own immigration policy? Uh, and uh, our speakers tonight have been undertaking work financed by the Economic and Social Research Council, uh, and that's part of a major program that the ESRC are undertaking on issues related to uh, potential uh, uh, democratic change in Scotland. And uh, David Bell, I suspect, will be very well known to you, but uh, he's joined by uh, two colleagues on the podium, and another will be joining for the Q&A. It's uh, been a four-handed affair, this piece of work, with others uh, uh, also helping. So our chairman for this evening um, uh, is the chief executive of the National Records of Scotland, which is wholly appropriate. I think uh, when we last spoke on migration, uh, his predecessor was in the chair, uh, when Robert Wright was with us. I think that's right, isn't it, Robert? Um, so uh, uh, it's good that we continue with that and to have someone who really knows the story on the data uh, presiding over what should be a, a very interesting story. I think it's one of the fascinating issues is whether it would make economic sense for Scotland to have its own immigration policy under the, exist the status quo or with further devolution or independence. And it's an even more interesting question whether people in Scotland would wish to have a different um, population policy. So we'll find out a lot more over the next 45 minutes. But I'm now going to pass you over to Tim Ellis to introduce the speakers for this evening. Tim, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy, and welcome to everybody uh, tonight. So my, my role tonight is, is as uh, is chair to try and keep a number of academics under control. This is not an easy task, um, so I'll seek your, your and their forbearance uh, with that. Um, as, as Jeremy's alluded to, I come in a long line of illustrious, far more illustrious uh, forebears than I do, uh, and who have attempted over, over the years, over 150 years actually, to try and keep track of Scotland's population, and indeed more recently to, to project forward um, to, to see what might, might be. And of course all of that is done with help from other experts, so the relationship between the National Records of Scotland and its forebears and, and academia is, is really uh, important to us. For those of you who haven't worked it out, the National Records of Scotland is only three years old, but it uh, was formed by two other, from the merger of two other very august institutions, the General Register Office for Scotland and the National Archives of Scotland. Uh, and I'm delighted that we're able to be associated tonight with three other uh, equally august institutions, the David Hume Institute, our host for today, so um, thanks to, to Jeremy and others for that. Uh, the uh, ESRC, who have funded much of the research, um, which will be um, presented to you today, and uh, the Centre for Population Change, uh, from which our speakers uh, are, are drawn. They are a distinguished panel, or a panel of distinguished speakers, I'm not quite sure which, we'll find out. Um, first off, I think, is going to be Alan Finlay, Professor uh, and Head of Department for Geography and Sustainable Development at St Andrews University, followed by Dr David McCollum, Lecturer in the Department for Geography and Sustainable Development at Andrews St Andrews University, and David Bell, uh, Professor of Economics at Stirling University, uh, and as Jeremy's alluded to, much more besides. Um, not speaking um, to, tonight, but a key member of the team, uh, Dr. Jakob Biak, who's the Senior Lecturer in Demography at the University of Southampton, who's here to answer the technical questions, I understand. He's now shifting nervously in his seat uh, <laughs> at that respect. Um, as Jerry said, uh, later this year there will be an opportunity to take part in a historic referendum, and whatever your views on that, um, the proposition uh, has, and indeed I think should, stimulate debate about the policy choices that face us uh, as a nation. Um, and I think it's important that uh, that debate should be, as far as possible, evidence-based, um, even if ultimately um, where you place your cross on the ballot paper in due course is more than a purely intellectual exercise. So I look forward tonight to hearing from our speakers who will, I'm sure, inform us, instruct us, possibly even entertain us. 
<laughs> Alan, with that, <laughs> would you like to open the... Thank the, you very much. Well, thank you again very much for giving up time, he says, entertaining you by putting his notes away. Um, thank you for giving up time this evening to uh, join us for this discussion. Um, I'll speak for maybe about 20 minutes, and then David for 10, and then David Bell uh, will uh, close off the talk. So um, you can see uh, here a number of names, but that's just the tip of the iceberg of those people that uh, the ESRC has encouraged to uh, participate in this search for evidence to give us the best view and best understanding of Scotland's place uh, in terms of migration flows and where that enters into the debate about constitutional change. Underneath uh, the uh, uh, hierarchy, there are many other folks who have contributed. Um, we've been delighted that colleagues at Southampton, including Eric Wisniewski uh, at Southampton, have contributed to the forecasting. Uh, we have people like uh, Robert Wright in the audience who's contributed to our uh, working uh, paper on student migration. Uh, and we have research teams, both at Stirling uh, and also at St Andrews, who've done a lot of the hard work. And so I'm pleased just to acknowledge Helen Packwood and uh, Scott Tyndall, who are in the audience uh, tonight, who've been part of the research team. So um, we've heard a little bit from uh, the introductory speakers about the plan of where we're going and what we want to say. I just want to suggest uh, a rough outline that before we think about the issue of policy, we have to think about what the evidence is relating to international migration and internal migration and Scotland. We need to think about the things that we're not so sure about, not talking about the past, but the future. What are the possibilities that we might think about in terms of what will happen to migration into the future? And that's where migration forecasts would enter our discussion. Then I'm going to speak a little bit about the demographic uh, drivers that might be one reason for Scotland arguing for having a distinctive migration policy before David will talk about employers and the work that we've done talking with, uh, well, we've had a, a survey of over 700 employers and we've thought about why they have a distinctive view uh, on migration. And then David Bell will talk more about the economy and also about the issues that arise when you think about how we balance economic interests and public opinion. So that's the uh, chart of where we want to go. So first of all, demography and international migration. And clearly we're very fortunate uh, in being able to plot year on year what we know about the net balance to Scotland from the data that we have, uh, both from the census and from the mid-year estimates produced um, by uh, the National Records Office for Scotland. And so here's the chart that shows the big picture of Scotland moving from a situation of being a country which was a net loser by migration, more people left and entered. Over the decades, that has moved to a situation of balance. And then over the last 10 years, a situation where international migration in particular has driven Scotland into a novel position of actually being a net uh, gainer from international migration flows. There's also a small uh, net inflow from other parts of the United Kingdom. And that's really quite an important uh, point at the end there, because when we think about Scotland's overall population, what we see then is that migration is now contributing very significantly to Scotland's position, not as a stagnant demographic unit, but one that has been growing. If we compare, compare Scotland with England, as is inevitable in the context of constitutional debate, we see a second issue that we all have, have to bear in mind when we begin to think about policy. And that is that Scotland fundamentally has much less uh, migrant migration, it has a lower uh, number of people who are born abroad in our population. And you can see Scotland there sitting with a much lower uh, percentage of its population born outside uh, of the United Kingdom than is the case for England. And these, that data is contrasted there uh, with other parts uh, of the EU, and it's the, the British figures are based on the 2011 census. And so we could generalise and say that England uh, is uh, in the top set of countries in terms of having quite a high level of immigration uh, from other countries. Uh, Scotland, by contrast, is down near the bottom of the chart uh, with relatively low levels uh, of foreign-born uh, people uh, living here. The next demographic issue that is important context for us uh, is that Scotland, like many uh, European countries, is experiencing ageing, uh, the process by which the balance of births and deaths is producing a change in the structure of our population. And the chart on the left-hand side, again taken from the 2001 and 2011 censuses from the National Records Office of Scotland, uh, shows the upward shift in the population, uh, the pattern uh, of the blanks 
uh, there uh, are picked out where we see the upward shift of cohorts towards older generations between the 2001 and the 2011 census. So Scotland is an aging population. And where does migration fit into that? Well, international migration in particular contributes to trying to rebalance uh, that demographic shift by bringing younger people. And I've simply picked out two charts here, which we've looked at and which are produced in some of our working papers, that show that Scotland not only uh, receives a significant number of uh, children who come with their parents as migrants, much like many other regions in the United Kingdom, but specifically the working age population, uh, we have a very significant boost of people in the working age cohorts. And again, I've just picked out one of those cohorts, but contrast the Scottish native population, 6.5% uh, are between 25 and 29 years of age. And by contrast, more than three times that number amongst the international migrant population living in Scotland. And if we think about this relative to the flows from England and other parts of the United Kingdom into Scotland, this diagram uh, shows that international migrants are rather different from migrants from south of the border. While uh, migrants from outside the UK bring Scotland lots of people in the teens and in their 20s, international mig uh, internal migration of other parts of the United Kingdom is rather in the other direction. We actually have a net outflow to other parts of the United Kingdom amongst people in their 20s, and the inflows, the net gains, are rather later in life. So if you remember the issue of aging then, it is international migration that is significant in helping to rebalance the natural trend towards aging in our population. The census also tells us that Scotland has global reach. We do not simply have international migrants from one or two places. We have a global spread, and it is not so different uh, if we were to map the pattern for the United Kingdom. And that's not surprising because we have a long history, of course, of being part of the British Empire, of having relationships with the Commonwealth, of engaging as uh, an economy uh, with other parts of the world, with companies that are multinational, uh, many of them based in Scotland. What is different is when we look at the significance of inflows from particular countries, uh, we see that some of them have much larger proportional inflows to Scotland than is the case for England. So, for example, with the accession states uh, entering the, the European Union uh, in 2004, we have very significant flows, as we know, into the United Kingdom from places such as Poland. And because these flows are not controlled by British immigration policy, these migrants are free to move to whichever part of the United Kingdom they choose. And we can see that the consequence of that uh, has been uh, that Scotland has actually been very attractive to Polish migrants, uh, uh, relatively speaking, uh, relative to uh, England. That figure is only a relative one, though, because what we also have is, as we've already demonstrated, a lower proportion of migrants who have come from British Commonwealth origins and are part of the United Kingdom, and hence they come slightly lower down that table. So the pattern for Scotland is different, uh, and we talk a great deal more about that in some of our briefing papers, which you're welcome uh, to take away at the end of today, or you could look at them on the Centre for Population Change website. Okay. So much for what we know. What do we not know? What we don't know, uh, of course, is what's going to happen to uh, uh, migration into the future. So one of the main objectives in terms of trying to add evidence uh, to the debate has been trying to explore different scenarios for migration uh, into the future, and particularly looking forward uh, uh, the next uh, few years. The National Records Office uh, already produces uh, uh, voluble forward looks as to what is to be expected with regard to net migration. And I've represented for you there the three figures uh, that are part of the most recent mid-year estimates and forward-looking forecasts. What our study did was to try to look at the directions of flow in particular detail and to try to examine the degrees of uncertainty that a range of experts uh, uh, felt were associated with thinking forward about migration in the context of constitutional change and in the context of what we can expect about global economic change and where that will put Scotland. Uh, so the methods that we've used uh, were to combine the existing known data series uh, and what would happen if we just ran those forward into the future with weightings derived from uh, some expert opinions derived from a Delphi uh, panel. 
The results of these are represented here very briefly in, in this chart, and it splits migration in terms of movements with the rest of the United Kingdom uh, and migration uh, to the rest of the world and from the rest of the world. And there's several key points that arise from these, and I'm going to only talk to them very briefly, uh, and you can ask more questions about this later. First of all, just to explain the chart, the black line uh, is the historical time series data that's available on each of these flows. On the right-hand side of each chart are fans that show the likelihood of different outcomes uh, arising as a result of the forecast. And largely, the darker the shading on the right-hand side, the more likelihood it is that a particular outcome will take place. We could talk a great deal more about that, but let's just focus on four main features. First of all, all migration forecasting is a very uncertain affair. Migration is not like births and deaths. It is much harder to forecast because there are so many unknowns. However, what we do know is that uh, the uncertainty around the different types of flows vary rather significantly. The greatest uncertainty is about international migration, less uncertainty about emigration uh, or about migration with the rest of the United Kingdom. The time series data and the expert panels both think that regardless of the referendum, the future for migration with the rest of the United Kingdom will show remarkably little change. And that's quite important when we start talking about policies. Uh, people on that panel and the time series data show that, of course, we're strongly linked with the rest of the United Kingdom, that flows are affected by economic cycles, they're affected by the demographic links that we have through family links and so on. Those flows will not be changed so much. Emigration is, of course, not controlled by Im immigration policy, obvious thing to say, but it's important to recognize that we do not control how many Scots will leave this country. That will be an effect that will emerge from Scotland's economy relative to the economies of the rest of the world and people's views of the desirability of living here. It is immigration where the greatest uncertainty lies and where immigration policy has a role to play. Now, we can talk more about the forecasts if you like. What I want to do now, though, is simply to turn to the policy issue and then to hand over to David uh, to talk particularly about employers. I want to talk about the demographic issues with regard to migration. UK immigration policy doesn't mention demographic targets. It doesn't mention demographic drivers. But as we know, there is a net migration cap that has been set, a target of 100,000. We also know uh, from today's releases of information, if any of you have been following what's been happening today, uh, that the actual figure uh, in terms of net migration has risen uh, in the most recent period. And we now see uh, a resurgence in the volume of immigration coming into Britain, despite the UK's uh, relatively negative rhetoric on immigration over recent years, and despite the ways in which the uh, current government has tried to uh, move uh, towards restricting international migration from outside uh, the European Union. By contrast, if we look at the context of Scotland, uh, we have had a history of different parties uh, actually suggesting that migration is good for Scotland, uh, the fresh talent policy, of course, reaching back to uh, Jack McConnell and his government, uh, and the more recent and, and current uh, 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 government, uh, both endorse a more positive perspective on migration. And as part of that, certain uh, targets have been set, some of which are demographic ones. So we have a current Scottish government target, uh, which is for Scotland's population, to match the average of the EU 15 countries over the period 2007 to 2017. And there's just a couple of quotes at the end there that point out that this is not a demographic target for its own sake. It's not a question of numbers for their own sake. It's not an arbitrary number like the migration cap that we have from UK-British policy. Rather, it is a demographic target that is driven by the fact that it's recognized that we want our working population to continue to be dynamic and to have active members uh, within it coming uh, from other parts of the world as well as from the United Kingdom. Uh, and secondly, uh, that there are ways in which other parts of the British economy, sorry, the Scottish economy can benefit. For example, universities uh, benefit greatly from the flow of students uh, from around the world uh, into these universities. Here's the data that we can see if we go to the Scottish Government website that relates to uh, the annual uh, uh, rates of population change in Scotland and the EU15, which are the target group that we measure ourselves against. And what's interesting is when we look at that graph and you look at the right-hand side, you do see uh, that over recent years, 
Four out of the last six years, we have a situation uh, in which uh, the Scottish uh, growth rate uh, is higher than the EU average, and so it is moving in the right direction in terms of the, the target that the government has. That has been achieved not because of a huge change in the demographic regime, births and deaths uh, are, are still uh, leaving Scotland in a fairly stagnant position, but it has been achieved because of immigration, the scale uh, of net immigration, particularly international migration. Now, if we had longer, we could look in detail at the disagre disaggregation of flows into Scotland. I'm only going to pick out uh, one example, and that is international uh, migration of students. If we look at the right-hand diagram, we can see why demography is very important here. If Scotland's uh, higher education institutions were affected only by Scotland's population, they would see falling numbers of students uh, being in the age groups uh, that would be natural cohorts for recruiting into first-year first university courses. What we see is looking into the future, that red line, the projected fall uh, of the number of domiciled Scottish students that would be eligible uh, for going to university. The fact that Scottish universities have seen a continued rise uh, in uh, student numbers and a relative buoyancy, both economically and demographically, has been, of course, because of their attraction, both of students from south of the border and, more importantly, internationally. And I've just picked out a few of the flows uh, in terms of key international flows uh, into uh, Scottish universities. Uh, and we can see here in the blue line, in particular, the significance of flows from Asia. But notice that downward dip uh, in the last year, which has been much discussed, um, uh, and various discussions have taken place as to why uh, that downward dip in the number of students coming from Asia, or indeed uh, from Africa, is taking place. Maintaining a significant flow of international students matters to Scotland, and it matters to Scottish universities more than to equivalent higher education institutions in other parts of the United Kingdom. And we can see this in this diagram, which shows uh, that students uh, from outside of the UK are a much higher percentage of all students in Scottish higher education than is the case for Wales, England, or Northern Ireland. Now, my last two screens, before I hand over to David, simply say that, first of all, much of this discussion has compared Scotland with England. But we can also question, should the comparisons actually be between Scotland and the other regions of the United Kingdom? This graph returns us to the proportion of people from outside the United Kingdom in each of the regions of the United Kingdom. And the standout feature is that London is very different from the rest of the country. And it raises the question, should we be talking about a Scottish immigration policy or should we be talking about a policy which is focused on London and the southeast as opposed to the rest of the country? And that question becomes more acute when we start looking at the relationships between migrant populations and economic issues. And this diagram uh, does just that. It shows gross weekly wages, and it shows, again, the outlier in this relationship is London and the southeast, and the other points for the other regions of the United Kingdom all lie on the left-hand side. A second point that really matters here is look at Scotland and look how far it falls below the best fit line. Why is it that Scotland has less migrants than you'd expect if the neoclassical assumption uh, held uh, that the wage levels in a region should attract uh, a proportion of migrants relative to the well-being and capacity of that economy uh, to support migrant workers? Is it that UK immigration policy is not supporting Scotland and meeting its needs? That is the question that that diagram raises. The answer is what we're going to debate. So I'm going to hand over to other speakers now to take it forward. Thank you. OK, thank you, Alan. Thank you very much. Perfect time as well. <clears throat> OK, um, so Alan's spoken uh, very expertly about um, the demographics of constitutional change and migration for Scotland. What I'm going to do for the next 10 minutes or so is talk about our research uh, with employers in Scotland. OK, so what do employers think about Constitution, the constitutional change question and about immigration. Okay, so I'm going to focus on four key points. The first point is what do employers think about immigration in Scotland? Secondly, why do employers think these things about immigration in Scotland? The third point refers to what would employers like in relation to immigration in Scotland? And finally, I'm going to reflect on 
what influence employers might have on trying to shape immigration policy in Scotland. And finally, um, I'm just going to reflect on some of the policy implications um, of our research, which has involved um, employers. Okay? So the first, the starting point uh, for our research was the rather straightforward question of what do employers think about immigration? Um, to try and answer this question, as Al mentioned, um, during the summer we conducted an online survey through the Scottish Chambers of Commerce. And a part of this survey we asked employers to rank and rate the issues which are important to them in the context of the constitutional change debate. And we could talk about the survey for quite a while, but we're just going to look at one slide, one uh, aspect of findings from the survey just now. And that is the, the, the fact that um, out of the, the, the sectors which are listed, um, all of the sectors, more than half of respondents, said that visa and immigration uh, legislation was important to the functioning of their business. Okay, so the message is immigration matters potentially quite a bit to most, part, most sectors of the Scottish economy. So the next question is, why does it matter? So to try and answer this question, uh, we carried out uh, 20 interviews with uh, employers and represent, business representa uh, rep representation bodies um, in Scotland. Okay? To try and think about the key issues, why, why employers say they value migration. Okay? And from that research, we've tried, we've tried to identify uh, the four key themes in terms of why immigration matters to businesses in Scotland. Okay? The first argument developed by employers is a demographic one. Um, Alan alluded to the demographic deficit, which potentially um, affects, might affect Scotland in the future. So employers quite often draw on this and say that we need immigration to uh, bring more working age uh, workers into Scotland. The second issue uh, tends to draw on an economic growth argument. The idea is that immigrants are presented as being a catalyst for economic growth and having a net fiscal gain for Scotland. Related to that is the idea that immigrants help to fill important skills gaps and labour shortages in the Scottish economy. And finally, um, employers quite often draw on the narrative of uh, migrant selec selec as being a select self-selecting process, whereby uh, people with, who are young, ambitious and skilled tend to move, and as a consequence, these workers tend to have a relatively positive work ethic compared potentially to non-migrants. Of course, we can deconstruct that. Okay, but the message seems to be that employers are saying immigration is good for business and by implication, good for Scotland. Okay? So that's what employers think about immigration and why they think potentially those things about immigration. The next thing we want to consider is what do employers want in consideration in relation to immigration policy in Scotland in the future? Um, the key point, uh, the most important point perhaps, is that universally employers were very, very uh, praising of the idea of the free movement of labour within Europe. Okay? So the concern amongst employers is that Scotland, but also the rest of the UK, remains part of the European Union into the future. Um, in terms of migration which doesn't come from the rest of Europe, um, there was a concern that the points-based system um, is becoming increasingly restrictive, and perhaps we saw that today, although net migration has gone up, the number of migrants into the UK from outside of Europe has actually decreased. Um, there's also a concern, perhaps, that immigration policy um, in the UK is set and determined by the views, um, experiences, and needs of the southeast of England, as opposed to perhaps the UK more generally. And this can be to the detriment of other parts of the UK, including Scotland. <clears throat> so what is it employers would recommend or advocate in terms of future immigration policies? Um, our employers didn't necessarily want a radically liberal open door immigration policy. A lot of the um, recommendations were quite pragmatic. Um, for example, a more uh, sophisticated points-based system um, as opposed to a radically open-door system. Um, also, they talked about not the importance just of policies, but uh, rhetoric in relation to policy. Okay? So uh, politicians in Scotland were actually praised for having, uh, making positive noises about Scotland being welcoming of migrants, whereas this was contrasted to the experiences and the noises coming from Westminster. Okay? So that's what employers want in relation to immigration policy, but how might they try and achieve these types of immigration policies? Um, it's quite interesting that employers didn't necessarily talk about independence being an opportunity to get the type of immigration policy they wanted, but they talked about the debate surrounding Im immigration policy as being an opportunity to raise issues 
um, like the events, this, the discussion we're having just now. Okay, so these sort of, this sort of forum, this sort of debate is seen as an opportunity to try and push for a more favourable immigration policy, regardless of what happens um, in September. <clears throat> so the implication might be that employers are vigorously lobbying or trying to have a direct influence on immigration policy. Um, we find this wasn't necessarily the case. Um, some employers, some businesses do seem to be lobbying in its various guises. Um, however, uh, by no means, not all employers are trying to directly influence policy. And some employers actually are quite critical that their, their voices aren't really being heard or they're not being engaged with um, in terms of the constitutional change debate and the types of immigration policies they would like to see for Scotland. OK, so that was a very, very quick overview uh, of some of the research we've been doing with businesses in Scotland. So what can we draw from this moving forward? Uh, the first point might be that there's um, sufficient grounds for a more nuanced immigration policy in Scotland. This is because uh, current legislation relating to non-EU migration is seen as increasingly restrictive and is seen as needing the means and experiences and views of the southeast of England as opposed to other parts of the UK. And the constitutional change debate seems an opportunity to press for more favourable and more sophisticated uh, immigration policies for Scotland. So what are the policy options? Um, trying to reflect on what employers have said and the other research that we've conducted, the idea might be that whatever happens in the context of the referendum, Scotland faces quite significant opportunities, but also challenges in terms of developing a more nuanced immigration policy. So if Scotland votes uh, no in September, what we might see is that well, our point would be that we don't necessarily need independence in Scotland for Scotland to have a more nuanced or more independent immigration policy. As the examples of Canada and Australia have shown, it's possible, it's quite possible to have subnational immigration policies operating within a broader national framework. However, it is important to acknowledge that these types of policies, these types of measures, would face uh, some potentially quite considerable uh, political as well as practical barriers. On the other hand, if Scotland votes yes, an independent Scotland wouldn't necessarily have a particularly independent immigration policy. This is mainly because Scotland would seek to stay in the common travel area with the rest of the UK and with Ireland, and as a consequence, probably couldn't have a radically different immigration policy from those countries. And of course, Scotland would seek to be in the European Union and would have limited influence over migration because for that reason as well. Okay, so that's a very quick overview of our research with employers. Over to David. So I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm going to finish off um, talking a little bit about the political economy of migration. That takes, takes up really where, where uh, uh, David uh, uh, left off. Employers' views are important, but they aren't necessarily the drivers of, uh, of uh, migration policy. Certainly that's pretty obvious in the UK at the moment, where pressures uh, around immigration are particularly strong, particularly in England, I guess. Um, in general, it, it would be uh, true to say that uh, perceptions of public perceptions of, of uh, migration generally negative. These centre around the labour market, around concerns that uh, migrants are, have, are getting access to welfare and, I guess, housing as well in, in some kind of unfair way. And there may also be uh, uh, opposition to uh, migration on the basis of racial or, or cultural concerns. Um, welfare concerns, although they, in practice they are uh, negligible almost, play a, a more important role in determination of attitudes to further migration than do labour market concerns. Um, uh, ethnic racial prejudices don't play mu much of a, 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 of, a, of a role, particularly in Scotland. Um, so there's the public concern about migration. On the other hand, there's the economic benefits of migration and migration is selective. This slide is a little complicated, uh, but it does try to demonstrate around that. So it's data on the hourly wages of people who've been born outside um, the, well, it, 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 it's where they're born along the horizontal axis, 
where they reside is either uh, pale blue England or dark blue Scotland. The numbers are set to 100 for Scots residing in Scotland, working in Scotland, and English residing in England. So what we see is typically that aside from Poles, I'm afraid, and uh, Pakistanis, uh, most other places of birth have higher mean earnings than do the natives, which are in the, uh, in the, uh, the, the dashed shaded groups, either uh, dashes or, or horizontal lines. So uh, uh, <coughs> English living in Scotland, on average, earn more than 20% more than the average Scots. Uh, Scots uh, uh, living in England earn about 20% more than the average English person, and so on. But you see, in general, people living outside the country in which uh, uh, they were born tend to earn, earn more. Now, the, a lot has been written about this stuff. Uh, uh, Christian Dustman and uh, others at UCL have done a lot of work on this, but just <coughs> uh, shows that the arguments that in general apply to the UK as a whole also apply in Scotland. I don't think we've done figures for Scotland specifically prior to this. So now I just want to look at some research that Compass at the University of Oxford has been doing, around, again around public attitudes in Scotland and the other parts of the UK in relation to migration. So <clears throat> there are th I've got three slides here from the Migration ob uh, 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 Observatory. And, and the, the main point is that Scots are less opposed to migration than those in the rest of the UK. This first slide shows preferences for increasing or reducing uh, immigration. And the big red line are the number of people, represent the proportion of people in England and Wales who would like to see it reduced a lot. The green line, Scots, although in general, Scots would like to see it reduced. They don't want to see it, uh, or a, a smaller proportion of them want to see it <coughs> uh, reduced a lot than is the case in, uh, in England and Wales. Then if you take um, immigration as being good uh, uh, or bad for Scotland uh, relative to Britain, so we ask people in England and Wales, do they think Engl uh, immigration is good uh, or bad? And then we ask people in Scotland, do they think immigration is good or bad? And in general, the green bars are up to the right. Checking I've got this the right way around. And the red bars are down to the left where it's bad. So good is up to the right and uh, bad down to the left. So uh, it's, again, a similar kind of story uh, for, uh, for differences between uh, Scotland and uh, Wales. So, in, the compass evidence tends to suggest that uh, Scots, Scots are more welcome, well, more, more welcoming or less hostile towards immigration. 58% um, uh, desire reductions in immigration, whereas in England and Wales, 75% uh, desire reductions in immigration. There is strong support also in the Compass work uh, for Scotland to control its own immigration policy. Uh, so 60% <clears throat> of, uh, of Scots responding to the Compass survey thought that migration policy should be controlled from Scotland, whereas only 31% thought the UK government uh, uh, should support it. My next couple of slides, I'm going to... Um, uh, show uh, some data that we've collected at Stirling uh, in relation to immigration. And it's, it's about how different attitudes uh, uh, cross-tabulated against uh, people's in voting intentions. Um, and what's, pos well, what's unusual about this is that, is that uh, yes voters seem less uh, desirous of reducing immigration than is the case for no voters. So this is um, the breakdown of whether people think that the level of migration into Scotland in the, in the last decade has been 
too low, about right, too high, or, or don't know. And in general, the, the uh, uh, yes voters are less uh, uh, in favor of the argument that the level of migration has been too high. Uh, similarly, asking people what they think might happen if Scotland became independent um, would there be more immigrants, which would be a good thing, more immigrants, which would be a bad thing, a fewer immigrants, which would be a good thing, fewer immigrants, a uh, bad thing, or indeed whether the uh, outcome matters. It's interesting that uh, on the more immigrants, a bad thing, no voters quite substantially exceed uh, yes voters uh, and the don't knows on that on that particular uh, uh, question, which is it is it's interesting in the sense that most uh, movements towards independence are often around keeping some kind of cultural or um, um, ethnic uh, homogeneity uh, that doesn't seem to be uh, revealed at all from these kinds of responses. So. Uh, David has talked about the UK points-based system, so now I'm slipping back to policy. Um, oh, sorry. What, one thing I should say before, before I slip back onto policy is that I'm just looking at a, a kind of one dimension of uh, uh, explanation of, of people's attitudes to migration. I haven't done the other factors that might influence uh, uh, attitudes to immigration. Here it's also clear that age is a big is a big determinant. So those uh, older people typically are more likely to be against uh, uh, more immigration, whereas the young are much more relaxed about it. So the UK points-based system uh, splits up uh, um, uh, uh, immigrants or applicants for for uh, immigrant status into five groups. That's the way it works. Points-based systems work uh, in similar ways in many other countries. Uh, you won't be able to see this, but it's complicated. You get different numbers of points for different attributes, how much you earned in the last few years, uh, and so on. If you've got a PhD, that's worth 50 points. Master's is only worth 35, and, and so on. I'm not I don't care about the details of this, it's just the principle of how, you, of how you do it. Interestingly, that's what Quebec does, which is even more complicated, uh, and I can't read that, but it's the same principle. And the interesting thing is that Quebec has a policy that is different from that of, uh, of Canada as a whole. It is similar, but the allocation of points is different especially, for example, allocation according to what language you speak. Uh, and that policy has been in place for quite some time. And there doesn't, uh, at the moment, appear to be any strong uh, argument against uh, about um, uh, replacing it. So it is possible to have a sub-national immigration policy. We had it briefly uh, a, with... Um, Jack McConnell uh, and uh, uh, the um, two years post-graduation offer uh, to uh, students from outside the, the EU uh, graduating in Scotland. Fresh talent. So if you are going to have a sub-national immigration policy, it seems to me that it has to be uh, you have to get the political consent from both subnational and national governments. It has to be acceptable to the publics in both in both uh, uh, jurisdictions. It has to be uh, worthwhile doing. It has to there has to be uh, some effectiveness in meeting its objectives, and it, it hasn't to be too successful in the sense that it has to be somehow or other stable within a, a, a devolved settlement so that it, uh, it doesn't in any way under, undermine uh, that settlement. This is what, that, that was uh, the, uh, uh, the, maybe the conditions for a uh, subnational immigration policy. This is what the white paper says. So this is 
migration policy <coughs> under independence. So it's continuing, as David said, in the common travel area with the rest of the UK and Ireland. Um, again, it's quite cautious, actually. It's saying, yeah, uh, Scotland will operate a points-based system uh, post-independence. Um, there will be some tinkering around uh, financial maintenance thresholds and minimal sal salary levels for entry to align them with Scottish average wages and cost of living. Well, that won't be all that much of a tinkering around given that there isn't that much difference between Scottish and, and UK uh, average uh, wages and cost of living. Um, the, uh, there's going to be some work on the uh, effectively reintroducing fresh talent and that uh, treatment of, uh, of asylum seekers would be done within Scotland, not surprisingly. So those are the, the, the proposals that are out there. Um, interestingly, Ireland is an independent country that operates within the common travel area, and there isn't pressure, much pressure from the UK for Ireland to uh, change its uh, immigration policy, which suggests that people aren't using Ireland as a stepping off point to, to gain access to the UK. That's because, of course, uh, EU citizens can move around free freely, but non-EEA, uh, that's the uh, correct definition, nationals w do need a, a visa. So access to the UK comes through either getting a visa or taking on Irish citizenship, which in itself is a complex process, uh, including being of good character and so on, and intending in good faith to reside in the state after naturalisation. So Ireland has a, um, uh, a different um, migration policy uh, from the UK, but it's not, it seems a great cause of concern, even though we do have a common travel area. So, to conclude, this is going back to what, what, we've, what everyone has said. Demographic arguments may favour a, a, a positive policy approach in Scotland towards migration, to, that's to do with demographic change. Employers clearly recognise benefits from uh, immigration. Um, there is a political economy issue in Scotland less severe than it is in the rest of the UK, but nevertheless it is there because public opinion doesn't favour increased immigration. Uh, a distinctive migration policy has been mapped out in the white paper, but a devolved settlement could also shape immigration to fit Scotland's needs. And then it's a question of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, checks and balances, I guess, whether... Um, you would face fewer constraints uh, in terms of implementation in a, 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 in a devolved settlement as opposed to full independence. I shall leave that open for debate and we shall stop there. Thank you very much to all our speakers there and an interesting point on which to leave it. We've got an opportunity now for some questions to our speakers or comments or debate. Um, Jacob, do you want to come and join us too? Um, let's start with one at the, at the back. Um, hello, is that working? Uh, could, brilliant. Could you, say, could you say your name and any uh, organisation? Uh, uh, yes, um, John Tibo from the Scottish Parliament. Um, one of the things that sort of seems to have come out of what you're saying is that actions speak louder than words and that you know, Britain goes through a recession, we see immigration drop, uh, and then Britain starts to move out of a recession, and despite the rhetoric, there seems to be a rise in immigration, as you're saying. So would it not be sort of uh, plausible to say that actually Scotland's immigration policy is much more dependent on their control over their economic levers rather than to do with any kind of uh, policy per se, and that actually it'll be to do with how well the SNP are able to put uh, forward their relationship with the pound after the referendum, or how well the other parties are going to be able to put forward their views for uh, increased tax devolution that will be the major determinants on Scotland's future immigration policy. 
Okay, I, I'll just say a few things about the starting point of your question. David may pick up on that. But, um, um, so I think you're making a very fair point. I mean, the, the, the early discussion that I was trying to introduce here was migration is a, a, a title that covers many different things, and many aspects of migration is not, are not, many aspects of migration processes are not governed by policy. So it flows in and out of the rest of the United Kingdom. It doesn't look as if um, what the policy is is going to have a huge impact. We could discuss that. Um, where we do see a difference is, of course, as uh, David alluded to and I alluded to, is flows from outside uh, the EU, where there's no doubt that either UK policy accounts for the recent downward shift, uh, or uh, the rhetoric uh, which goes out sends out a negative message that stops people wanting to come. But I think the point that you make, which I agree with entirely, is that the economic levers that, is a, that are available to Scotland or that are available to the UK are actually going to be very important regardless of the outcome of the referendum and whether we have a Scottish policy or whether we have a policy governed from the United Kingdom. Yeah, I, no, I, I pretty much agree with that. It's certainly, it, you know, immigration policy, it seems to me, is being used just to damp down uh, the level of, uh, of immigration from non-EU migrants at the moment and uh, as the economy recovers and indeed as the economy does relatively well compared with, with mainland Europe and other parts of the world, the pressure for uh, increased immigration will, will build up again. So, yeah, go ahead now. Nikra, Harriet Watt University. Um, much has been made of the favourable attitude that Scotland has towards migrants in comparison with the rest of the UK. I'm wondering to what extent that is based on the perception of low levels of migration here, and that regardless of the result of the vote, um, work Scotland to adopt its own immigration policy, which would lead probably to an increase in immigration. To what extent that then would be matched by greater hostility toward the migrants. Really, it's a question of whether there's an inherent link between the perception of levels of migration and hostility towards migrants. I, 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 think, that, I think that's probably, well, I can't be sure it's true because we, the, we don't really know the counterfactual, uh, but the, the state of play at the, uh, at the moment certainly is, uh, as Alan showed pretty clearly, we have a much lower level of um, uh, foreign-born within within Scotland, and there might be a threshold at which suddenly attitudes start to flip. Interestingly, I, what also seems to be true that we didn't really show, and uh, we discussed this earlier, I, it, it certainly seems to me that the foreign-born are more likely to describe themselves as Scots in Scotland than are the foreign-born in England to describe themselves as English. Yeah, I think that's certainly, that's certainly a rational assumption to make. And if, and if, we, if my immigration did come up uh, increase in Scotland, you can certainly assume that hostility would increase as well. Um, we did some analysis where we looked at um, regions of the UK, um, hostility in those regions compared to hostility, sorry, hostility versus immigrant population. And there wasn't necessarily a correlation there. Um, and of course, uh, in Scotland, we might have a, so far at least, there's been a, a political consensus that immigration's a good thing, and that isn't the case, certainly, south of the border. At the back? Oh, halfway through. Make this one down, sorry. <laughs> too, too, too forward, and then we'll come back to, come back to you. <laughs> sorry, the, the, the question's gone out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Press Bachelor. Uh, thank you. It's been a really interesting uh, presentation. I was struck by the fact that you, you showed how successful Scotland has been in attracting in migrants from the accession countries. Uh, and there's a pool of 450 million people across the EU who could migrate. And I'm wondering to what extent more could be done within the existing uh, freedom that Scotland has to attract in EU migrants. The, one of the employer surveys you pointed out said that, well, we've got a shortage of dentists here, mm -hmm. and there are lots of them in Romania. Well, there is nothing in UK immigration policies, as I understand it, that would prevent more Romanian dentists moving to Scotland. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, I guess that question probably comes to me. I mean, I think uh, your comments are absolutely spot on. I think it's important to recognize that Scotland has different historical links with Europe. There obviously were um, significant links with a range of countries, not just Poland, but a range of countries in the Baltic, which led to an existing uh, population here. So that may account for some of the linkages that have taken place and the increase in the number of um, uh, people coming subsequently. I think the second thing to say is that obviously our economy uh, in Scotland is in some ways distinctive. David is the uh, expert on this. But the significance of the agricultural sector, the importance of food processing, the importance of hotels and catering um, have perhaps lent uh, to a greater inflow of EU workers into those sectors. Uh, and, and I think that's a really important factor uh, to take account of. So I think the fact that we've had more people from certain parts of the EU may reflect these two forces uh, and not simply an issue of being more welcoming. Um, your question then is, could we then uh, take advantage uh, of the lower hostility to attract more uh, workers into the United Kingdom in general or into Scotland in particular? And I think you, you've chosen the example of dentists. Certainly the National Health Service uh, had um, a number of policies in place for attracting nurses from particular areas of Europe, for example, Spanish nurses into particular health boards uh, as an agreement in terms of trying to bring people for a limited period of time to receive particular training and then to go back. And that was a very successful uh, exchange. Uh, and so I think it has great potential. Uh, and if we think about migration in a positive way uh, like that, then I think uh, we can indeed uh, develop talent links that meet Scotland's needs uh, without increasing hostility to migration because it can be seen to be finely tuned. So I think, I think there's great potential in that. We've remembered the question now. <laughs> it's Joe Elliott. I'm a, a trustee of the David Hume Institute. Th there's an astonishing um, statistic in, in one of the slides showing that 37% um, of um, the population of London is, um, is foreign-born. Um, I find that just quite, a, quite a startling. Um, I mean, I wonder if you could uh, unpack that a, that a bit. I mean, one assumes that a, the, ma the majority of those foreign-born people are, are, are EU people, and, there may be a, a, an, and they may not be permanent residents. In other words, we, this may be a sort of phenomenon of uh, London being a kind of uh, world, world city and a lot of people kind of uh, w washing in and out. But the, the point that occurs to me is that th that being the case, uh, um, you know, it's only human for Westminster... Um, uh, legislators to be very much influenced by what they're, you know, what they're seeing on their doorsteps, as it were. I, I do, do think I'll comment, uh, comment on that as well. Yeah. David, you, you uh, um, actually, I think attitudes in London are, are, are pretty relaxed about about, about immigration. I guess if forty percent of them are themselves immigrants, that that, that might influence it. But it, no, it doesn't surprise. You know, it it really doesn't surprise me that 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 and and we're. Def now, I've forgotten precisely which boroughs, were, but it, this is London Boris's um, domain precisely. It's not going into the home counties. Um, what uh, is interesting is that I think a lot of them are not there to be, um, uh, you know, uh, temporary migrants. Quite a lot are permanent migrants. Otherwise, you wouldn't, I think, have three or four French schools now in London. Um, large chunks of, of, of certain populations have, have moved and I think are doing so on quite, on quite a significant basis. Yes, I, I, what David says is absolutely right, but your point about it being a global city, I think, is very important. Uh, and I think if we think about other global cities, the question is what migration policy makes global cities successful? Places like Hong Kong are separate in their migration policies from the rest of China, even though, of course, they're part of the same um, political unit. Um, and that gives them some advantages. Some people say Singapore's success is you have a global city with a very specific migration policy. Global cities to operate effectively need to be allowing transience of skills in and out uh, and to have a, an ability to do that and to attune their policies very precisely. That underpins then one of our main contentions. You know, should we be really thinking about London and the South East perhaps having one policy to allow that for the good of the UK economy? And should Scotland, along with the North East of England or the North West of England, have a rather different policy because of our different demographic and economic position? There's a question down, down here. Yeah. 
Uh, hi, I'm Christy Anderson from COSLA. Um, I'd like to query something um, Professor Bell said about um, Scottish average salaries and cost of living not differing much from the rest of UK and how that correlates with what Professor Findlay said about um, average salaries in Scotland being you know, very, very much lower than in the southeast of England. Um, and perhaps then it's a question for David about whether the Scottish employers in your research um, highlighted their inability to um, meet the high salary levels set in London in terms of attracting the skills they needed to their sector. Mm -hmm. I think that probably, that probably ties into the first question that policy is obviously important, but economics is obviously very important as well. So Scotland would compete with London, the South East for top talent. Um, they would compete globally as well. Um, for example, in the oil and gas industry, uh, salaries are very high, but we have to try and attract people to to Scotland and, and, and Aberdeenshire and Aberdeen, uh, they're not competing just against London and the South East, but other parts of the globe as well. And that's a challenge, probably, for employers. Have I answered your question? Um, <laughs> we do have um, most of the tier one, tier two migrants are attracted to London. Mm -hmm. um, so were the employers saying that that was, you know, due to the high salary levels set in London, set by the migration policy in south of, south of the east of England, for south east of England, basically, would lower wages set in Scotland for um, entry to the UK able, be, be able to let them fill the skills gaps? I'm not sure the employers explicitly reflected on that. Um, no, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think they did. Mm -hmm. I don't think they did. And I mean, your point is correct. And so I, I, I was correct in saying that Scottish salaries are about the UK average, and Alan was correct in saying that Scottish salaries are less than the South East. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, in terms of competition with um, the South East, um, Scotland in general, apart from areas like um, the north northeast of Scotland, which effectively is the second highest salary levels that 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 you've got in the UK. Um, uh, well, they they have to offer these these kinds of salaries to to have a chance in uh, in effectively a global market for skills in their particular sector. Um, and I, I was going to make that the, the point in relation to. The first, very first question at the back again, because Alan made the point about yeah, the, the the migrants have come into certain sectors. They've also come into certain areas, and they have filled skill ga skills gaps in Scotland where the uh, economy has potentially been overheating. And and here again, it's the northeast that I'm that I'm thinking about, and and they've had they've had a huge role there, much less so in parts of the Scottish economy which haven't been doing that well. Yes. I mean, if I may chip in to, 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 uh, to, to answering this question, there may be a, a statistical explanation for it as well, because the average, if you think of a distribution of, of income, the average is not the best uh, measure, given that distribu the, the distribution of income is very skewed. So we have very, very long, we call it tail of the distribution, with very, very high uh, salaries and wages. So, so probably, maybe if the comparison was done in terms of median income, so, so the, the India, the, the, uh, if you rank people uh, from the lowest to the highest income, the, the, that would be the, the income of the middle, of the person in the middle, then probably the, the picture might be slightly different. So, so that's something to, 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 to be checked. So it might be just a you know, presentational issue as well. Right. Lots of people want to speak. Uh, uh, Richard Curley, I wonder if you could... Um, reflect a little more and, and, and talk about the possibility of a distinct immigration policy for Scotland, even if the uh, outcome of the referendum is no. Um, you've referred to a number of different jurisdictions, all of which are very, very different. I mean, Hong Kong is a surveillance society, despite being a separate administrative region. Singapore operates immensely tight uh, controls over either uh, income or employment or student status, you know, four weeks out of university and you're out the door unless you're uh, otherwise engaged. Um, you refer to Quebec and parts of Australia. Um, what do we learn from them if 
we have a no vote and operate within the confines of a UK-wide immigration pattern. Um, <clears throat> well, so we, we've tried fresh talent. Uh, it got swallowed up by the um, changes to overall UK policy. We, uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the Quebec example is a useful one, but different from Scotland. It's not, it's not exactly the same. We have no direct comparators. We have put our toe in the water as far as this is concerned. I think there's clearly an argument for exploring what the options are. I don't want, I don't think uh, we want to uh, take on board a uh, separate migration policy that would involve uh, a great deal of control in the way that other parts of the world might uh, might existing might run their existing policies. So it seems to me that th this is an open question at the minute. I don't fully, uh, I, I don't think we yet have the answer, but I think we have, uh, uh, I think, a, a duty to think clearly about it and to see if there are, uh, explore uh, some possibilities in relation to it. I just wanted to add briefly, I'm sorry, there's lots of questions, so I don't want to speak too long. I mean, the points we've made is that there are probably different needs, so we would agree on that. Um, so Scotland has different needs, say, from the southeast of England. Secondly, because you've got different needs does not mean you can have a policy that is not constrained, because every country, whether independent or a region within a country, is constrained in the policies that they set. The question is, what are the levers that are most effective? And Scotland, at this point, obviously has the levers with an independent Scotland that might be uh, uh, more diverse, uh, or the possibility and this is what we've been suggesting that should not be thrown away in the event of a no vote. There's the possibility that Scotland should have a different policy, but within the United Kingdom. The levers will be different in that context, but the examples of Quebec or the examples of other parts uh, of the world are that it's possible to run either a points-based system or a system where visas are operated in a particular way uh, or to consider students in a different fashion. The question is, which elements of the migration flows are we going to have a distinctive policy on? Now, there's other people in the audience like, like, like Robert uh, Wright here who I'm sure you know, have got very good track record in looking at the Quebec case and might contribute to our discussion here. So uh, I don't claim to have all the answers. Come back, Robin. Just a minute. There's a lady at the back who's been waiting for a while. Hi, Nasra Bradley uh, from University of Glasgow. I had a similar question around similar basis, but slightly different. If uh, Scotland was to go down the no no path and want a subnational policy, one of the things that would probably be relevant is to understand why in the present graph that you st uh, showed, Scotland was an outlier in terms of the salary and the amount of immigration you already have. So it already seems to have a dysfunction that seems to be there and you would have to probably bridge that before you would be able to actually try and get some further benefits. So what is the present possible explanation for that gap? And how would you do it in a, in a subnational policy? Can, yes. we, can we pick up two or three? Yeah, please. Uh, hi, Jim, Jim Gallagher. I mean, this is a kind of follow-up to some of the discussion. I think uh, the interesting thing here is to think what the policy options are. Uh, and uh, I mean, one of the, the striking things about uh, the tools that we're talking about here is that the immigration policy tools that we've got are essentially, or that we've been talking about, are those tools which are designed to keep people out uh, rather than to let them in. Uh, and if your policy objective is to think how you bring people in, you might well choose to use a different set of tools. And that's where uh, my colleague on the left pointed out that Scotland has uh, immigration-free access to many hundreds of millions of people inside the EU is highly relevant. Now, what tools might you use if you wished to use uh, to attract people uh, from that space? That, that's my first question. Uh, a second one goes back to the, um, uh, the rather narrower question of how you might play tunes uh, on the immigration system itself. Uh, and that obviously brings an end to all lighting. <laughs> 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 uh, and that is it's really a question, uh, uh, I think, to David, 
and that is how big a constraint is the common travel area inside the, pr the present uh, British Isles. Uh, I got contradictory messages from the two speakers. One was that it was a big or potential constraint on immigration policy, and the other was that the Irish could do more or less what they liked. Now, uh, both of these things can't be true. Uh, which is it, and what's the nature of the constraint? And that leads you to the question, if you have a sub-national immigration policy inside a single nation state, what, if any, movement constraints do you apply to migrants who are allowed to come to one place but might want to sneak off to another? Yes. Alan, do you want to kick off with that? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Let me take the bridge question first of all. I mean, I think you're referring to the uh, diagram that I showed that had wages against the percentage of the population that were not born in the United Kingdom. And that showed actually that Scotland had higher wages than many of the other regions, uh, but lower levels of migration than you'd expect. Uh, and we've explored that in one of the papers that we've written for an academic journal. Uh, I mean, one of the interesting things is it isn't apparently to do with uh, a discriminatory behaviour in Scotland. So if it, if it was discrimination that was causing that bridge, that would be a cause of great concern. But, for example, the recent results of the census show that migrants living in Scotland are more likely to express a Scottish identity than migrants living in England or born from outside uh, England. Uh, so it isn't discrimination. So it's not a discrimination policy. Uh, we've also explored whether it's to do with the sectors of the economy. We don't think it's to do with that. So that does lead to the question, is it simply that Scotland is hiding its light under a bushel? Do we need to tell the world more about the opportunities that are here? Is that the reason? Or is it to do with not being able to reach the kinds of people that Scotland needs? And that's where it links to the second question. What are the levers that could actually help us to uh, attract the skills or the talents or the students that we want. Now, one of the interesting things was under the fresh talent policy, uh, the main thing was to actually have the message out there that Scotland was welcoming and that it wanted certain people. Uh, and there was a little bit of work done to try and measure whether during the fresh talent policy that was effective. And there seemed to be uh, the building of evidence before the policy ended that simply putting out that positive message and targeting particular groups of people that you wanted to attract was having some influence. So without using an economic lever, but just a, an information and a policy lever, Scotland was having some effect. Uh, I think going beyond that, institutional mechanisms do exist, which is why I used the Spanish example, where you can pair specific, where you can pair specific needs in a, uh, an institution such as the National Health Service to specific sources of migrants, uh, uh, again, within health services in other countries. That kind of uh, collaborative working uh, can be quite effective uh, and, I, and I think could be explored a great deal more uh, in the U EU context. So I perhaps answer the first question and a little bit of the second question and I'll leave others to answer the more difficult bits. <laughs> I f which I've forgotten. <laughs> 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 While you're thinking, can, can, yeah. I, can I just, can I just yeah. ab abuse my position as chair then be, to, to pick up on a couple of things there? I mean, one is we, it's around this question of targets and, and general approaches. And, and in a sense, it, with the, in the, with the, 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 the target, the, the, the cap that is set in the rest of the UK, you have a, that restrictive approach, that kind of preventative approach, but yet the numbers have gone up. And in Scotland, you have a target which says we want to um, be in line with the EU, and that's, if you like, the kind of um, attracting one, but as we've seen in the last year, numbers have gone down. Does this, does this suggest that uh, we can learn anything from, from targets and attitudes <laughs> at all? Uh, or are we, are we, are we um, swinging at uh, some mythical beast that we, that we can't, can't, can't fight? I think Jakob yeah, can answer the question I, I, on targets actually very well, so I'll, I'll okay. hand that to, to, to Jakob. Um, okay. Oh, gladly, thank you very much. Uh, you know, the, the problem with targets is uh, actually what, what are we targeting? The UK government targets net migration, which is a de facto a, a conflation of two processes that are somehow independent. And you can't really reasonably think of controlling emigration in a, demo a democratic country. So, so if by chance it happens that fewer people than expected are, are migrating to, to Costa Brava in a given year, well, tough for the target. And, and for immigration, you know, even, even, even then, it's only a fraction of, of those who, come, who are subject to, to any controls uh, upon arrival. So, so you know, it, it shows how difficult the whole targeting business is. Okay. Right, last, last question, I think, from the gentleman just there, because we're running out of time. <laughs> I, I was, sorry, George Brechen, I, I was wondering whether we were talking in terms of uh, both immigration and immigration of, of, of destinations or staging posts. So the question is, 
we get the skills of the parents, do we have any evidence on whether we keep the skills of the children and the grandchildren? In other words, do they just move in and move on? I don't think we could possibly answer that question mm. from the recent flows because there's lo lots of children with the, uh, since the EU accession migrants have arrived. Um, but one of the distinctive things about Scotland is we have a higher proportion of people who've come in recent years. Uh, we haven't got the second generation to check whether EU migrants' children are, are staying here and contributing. Um, but... I mean, we do know that... Um, um, Children from ethnic minority, with, from some ethnic minorities, are performing much better than than children than white children in a lot of England. That's absolutely the case. So I think we've we've kind of run out of time now. But there's there's still lots of people who want to talk, which um, is a good sign. And I think there is opportunity generally to continue that conversation um, with with one another uh, and that debate. But in the meantime, join with me, please, in thanking our speakers. Thank you. The opportunity certainly uh, exists over a glass of wine as well, courtesy of the David Hume Institute, or I should say actually on this occasion, courtesy of the Economic and Social Research Council. So thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple of points about what we've heard. Uh, things that, I mean, it's amazing the number of avenues we can go down in this, this topic. I mean, I was fascinated by the figures for um, breakdown of students at universities. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think that by in a few years' time, the number of non-UK resident students will be about equal to that of Scottish students in Scottish universities. So my question was going to be, is that a good or a bad thing for Scottish universities? So I'll talk about that over a glass of wine with you guys. Uh, we also know, of course, the importance of the position on the public finances. Uh, and uh, I think that the, the demographic story, again, tells us that um, without significant inward migration of young uh, people, we are going to face a very, an even worse position of the public finances than would be the case otherwise. And I think that makes it very important. And I personally am of the view that we can also expect the uh, young migrants to be distinctly more entrepreneurial in many ways than the indigenous population. It'd be very interesting. I'd be very interested to see studies of the extent to which new business formation, successful new business formation, has been related to inland migration. And of course, there is the continuing question whether uh, every, for every Scot who emigrates to England, that raises the IQ both north and south of the border, which, <laughs> uh, which is the old question. Um, but thank you very much, uh, Chairman and speakers, uh, for a fascinating seminar. We've only got two seminars left um, uh, for March uh, during my tenure at the David Hume Institute. So we have uh, next week Paul Johnson down at the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and I would advise those going to the Scottish Parliament, do leave plenty of time. Uh, it, just getting into the Parliament can take a little bit of time, but you can enjoy the walk um, and the wait. Uh, and secondly, we've got uh, Ian Marchant talking about the energy sector on the 18th of March. And Ian has told us um, that his views are likely to be challenging. Uh, and given what we've heard recently from, say, Ian Wood, and what we've heard also uh, from a number of other sources about what's happening in the North Sea, and knowing where we are on renewables, knowing where we are on single energy market, there's a huge amount that matters in the energy sector. And Ian, frankly, is as good a person as we can get to do that. So there's plenty coming up. Um, and I think we've had, uh, this is our sixth seminar so far, and we've got two more to go in uh, before the end of March. So you all should deserve a good glass of wine and a chance now to talk further with our chair and speakers. So I will thank them once more and wish you uh, cheers. Thank you. Thank you.